Aloha, everybody. It is your boy, Manga Man Drew, and yes, I am here to do once again my review of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 9 The JoJo Lands Chapter 2. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to continue doing this, but I mean, hey, I want to do it, so I'm going to do it. And when it comes to this chapter, we have an amazing surprise going on for this chapter. This was, once again, another fantastic chapter to really start the JoJo lands on a very wonderful start, especially with the reveal of who the Japanese person that they're going to be stealing the diamond from, as well as we get a little bit more understanding of who Joe Dio is as a character, and potentially that he is probably going to be the most evil Jojo that we've ever had, as well as just getting to get introduced to who the new characters are, the references that they are being made, as well as, once again, the reveal of who the Japanese man is at the end of this chapter. And spoilers, it's not who you expect it to be. So let's dive right into this chapter review and really talk about what's going on with Jojo's part two. Jojo's Part 9, The Jojo Lands, Chapter 2. And to start off, the title of this chapter, The Japanese Person on Hawaii's Island, is more or less just confirmation of what this chapter is going to be confirming at the end of this chapter, and that is who the Hawaiian man from Japan is. And I don't want to spoil it for you, but it's going to be somewhat unexpected. But something interesting that I want to bring up is that when it comes to this chapter, we get a sort of recap of what we learned in the last chapter, where we get the name of the characters, Marilyn Mayhew, uh, Dragona, Jodio, Paco. We get a little bit more tidbit information that we got from last chapter and this chapter, just in case people forget. While we also are introduced to potentially a new person, we do not see his name right now, but his name is revealed later on in this chapter, so we'll get to it when we get to it. And the chapter proper begins with a very young and attractive young lady approaching Jodio in front of, assumedly, what I have learned. is the Hawaiian Supreme Court building. And this entire sequence and this part of the chapter is just Joe Dio selling drugs to this woman in front of the Supreme Court. Yeah, I don't know uh, how intelligent Joe Dio is, but uh, yeah, that's like selling drugs in front of a police station. So yeah, what is happening right now and what's about to happen to Joe Dio is something that he put upon himself. Because this young lady is pretty much asking Jodio to purchase drugs from him. And she's doing it in a very obvious way. And Jodio is trying his best to try and tell her the correct way of doing it. He advises her like, oh, I don't know who you're talking about. Because she mentions that she knows a Kate. And he's like, oh, are you a college student? I don't really know anything about what's going on. But I mean, let's just say that uh, you owe me some money. Why not put some of that money in that can? And he's trying to be very like, not what am I trying to think of? He's trying to be a little bit more coy about it. He cannot just straight up say that he's a drug dealer because, you know, that's not something that you should do. Also, also we see that he's very wary of this individual because he does not know if she is trustworthy. Because we do get a little bit of dialogue that explains the situation that Joe Dio is when it comes to Meru Mei Q and it comes to her business and how she prefers to sell to, like, people that are in the school because it's more like profitable, but it's also more like secure. She knows these kids who are buying the drugs and that she knows that they are not like undercover cops or that they are people that can be a little bit more trustworthy, but that she did tell Joe Dio to more or less like expand the horizons, but not to go too far and to at the very most only sell to college students. And not to go too far, but to only really sell to college students and you have Joe Dio, who once again is very suspicious of this woman and believes that she is a cop. And she does say something that is very convincing, and that is if she was a cop, she would have to tell Joe Dio that she's a cop because that's the law. They cannot just lie, that they have to tell the truth. And Joe Dio even points out that I don't mm, I don't know about that. Like you could have a recording device in your bike, and she's like, oh no, 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 I promise you. But you know what? just forget it she just leaves she's about to leave but then Gio Dio comes back and convinces her and they seem to be on a very even basis they seem to have a very similar mentality to the point where she actually does put the money in the can and thinks that yeah I'm gonna buy drugs from you and Joe Dio's like okay cool 
by the way, if you want whatever you're talking about, because I have no idea what you're talking about, uh, you know, just go over a few places and you'll probably get what you're looking for. So yeah, this entire interaction is just very interesting. Just seeing how Joe Dio goes about actually selling drugs without confirming that he is to someone that he is very unsure of. And, you know, if you understand anything about this idea of undercover cops and whether or not they can have to, and if you know the idea of undercover cops and whether or not they have to tell people that they are cops, well, then you already know where this is going. Because as Joe Dio is directing Paco... Because as Joe Dio is directing this woman to Paco, where he apparently stashed some drugs underneath a leaf under her foot, it is revealed that she is definitely a cop. Wow, who would have thunk it? It's not like just because you're a cop doesn't mean that you can't lie. So yeah, this is something that I kind of expected was going to happen, especially when they brought up this idea that cops can't lie, because yes, of course they can lie. They're people. There's no law against you lying. There are laws against you. Be there, there are laws that punish you for lying, but there are no laws that say that you can't lie. So it just makes sense that she's actually a cop. And it's pretty much confirmed with her literally pulling out a gun and even saying that the bike that Joe Dio thought was recording them was actually recording them. And you may be thinking, oh no, what's going to be happening to Joe Dio? Is he going to be going to jail? Well, the situation gets a little bit worse for him. Because the two shitty cops that we saw last chapter are here. And if you thought that the one guy that was harassing Dragona was bad, it gets even worse in this chapter. Because not only does he want to once again harass and assault Dragona once again, but he's also wanting to harass and assault Joe Dio. You know, the 15-year-old kid. So, not only is he a rapist, but he's also a lover of children in a very illegal way. And he is just despicable. And even Joe Dio's like, yo, you're disgusting. I regret killing you. But then, this is where we get the purpose of this entire part of the chapter, which is just showing Joe Dio at his most sadistic potentially, as well as getting to see a little bit more of how his ability works. It is never straight up stated in this chapter how his ability works, but it seems to work in a way of him being able to kind of have Wayne, have rain precipitate in a certain area, and that that Wayne has and that Rain has the ability to like squish whatever Joe Dio more or less decides to squish and go into and crush it and destroy it in a sense. Because we see that it's able to like touch the bag and destroy it, which means that the police officers lost all of their material evidence, so they can't really arrest Joe Dio at this moment. But what's even more interesting about it is that we see that it's also touching the woman as well, but it doesn't seem to be doing a whole lot to her. And how we get more confirmation that this is a part of his stand, and that even if this is something that he wanted to give a piece of his mind for, in a sense where they'll be able to see it because they are no longer stand users or that they are not stand users, they have no idea what's going on, the rain just looks normal to them, and they eventually start being pelted and crushed and hurt by the rain coming from... Joe Dio's rain called September rain. November rain. And, and I do kind of like how Joe Dio is able to use his stand, but the entire purpose of this part of the chapter is pretty much to come to the point where it's revealed that Joe Dio is a psychopath. And you may be thinking, oh, you're just throwing around the word psychopath like willy-nilly. He's not actually a psychopath. No, he actually is. 
because this part of the chapter just ends with Joe Dio literally being confirmed to be a psychopath. Or specifically that he has antisocial personality disorder. Which to an extent makes sense and from what we've seen throughout the entire chapter so far, which would include this chapter and the last one, you can kind of see where this is coming from, especially when we get a checklist of the things that apply to Jodia, which is the in, in a, which includes the inability to control his actions, which we see that he somewhat has as seen in this chapter in the last chapter as well as lack of feelings of remorse or guilt, which you can definitely say that he lacks feelings of remorse and guilt after what he did to these police officers. And even though you could say that it is somewhat justified, you can't say that he isn't feeling any form of like remorse or guilt at this moment. So once again, revealing that Joe Dio is potentially on the level of technical evil as potentially Dio himself by both most likely being psychopaths. But what is even more interesting is that it's canonically confirmed within the story that this is going to be the case for Joe Dio. So we are following a JoJo character that may have a lot more sadistic and a lot more evil tendencies than any of the JoJo's or the main JoJo characters that we've had in the past. So I really like how we are building up who Joe Dio is as a character within these chapters and showing that he is not your normal Jojo main protagonist. That he is something different and potentially something brand new. But from there, the second part of this chapter is primarily focusing on the four characters arriving on Hawaii Island from Oahu Island to pretty much enact the plan to take and steal the diamond away from the Japanese man in Hawaii, or Hawaii. And this is where we get to get a little bit more about the fourth character that we didn't know prior, and his name is revealed to us to be... Usagi Aloha Oi. Which may be a reference to the song Aloha Oi, which was written by the last reigning monarch of the Hawaiian Island Kingdom, who wrote it after she was placed under after she was placed under house arrest following a coup d'etat and how the title actually translates to farewell to thee. Which makes sense because the word aloha can mean both, which makes sense because the word aloha could mean both hello and goodbye. And it seems that this type of idea and this reference may apply a little bit more to the character that we do not know at this moment. And the idea of Usagi is actually more in line with the Japanese ideal or translation most likely associated with Rabbit. Which he could probably tell by his personality because he's more or less very hyperactive. We see that he has two strands of like hair coming out of his face, which you could say is imitating bunny ears. And how from what we get with these first few interactions properly with uh, Usagi, he is very much a very flamboyant character. He's very loud. He's very brash. But we also get to see that he may have a layer of intelligence to him, especially when it comes to how he uses his stand in this chapter. And once again, it is confirmed that he is a stand user and we will be getting to his stand shortly. And we can see a little bit of that intelligence or more or less scheming from Usagi when it comes to how he asks and tells everyone about them needing $30 per person for a rental car, but it only costs $90 to rent the car, meaning that he didn't have to pay for the rental at all. 
as well as get confirmation of what his age is, which is that he is 17. And how he seems to be someone who has a drug problem, but is very trustworthy by the fact that Meryl May vouches for him. And as we're approaching the end of the chapter, we get to see these four characters begin to come up with a plan. After they've rented the car, they actually go to the location of where the Japanese are. They go to the location of where the Japanese person is, and they begin to enact a plan on how they're going to be able to steal the diamond. They notice that he really doesn't leave the area, but that he still hangs out in the pool. So they decide that when he goes out to the pool, then that is when they're going to go into the house and search for the diamond itself. And this is where we're revealed to Usagi's ability. As well as the time limit for how long this entire procedure will be taking place within, which is 15 minutes. And the name of the stand is actually called Mete Kurasai, which is based off the song by the same name by King Crimson. And his ability is more or less that he's able to have his little stand transformed into something that someone else wants. And that what he does is that he's able to transform this little creature into a camera that is able to produce a left and right camera which shows two different images, which would make it difficult for someone to pinpoint who this specific person is that is on the camera because of the two different feeds. And he also explains that this ability can only work as long as another person says what they want. So this is a very interesting stand, and it plays into the idea that these stands are not inherently combat based. You can't really use this ability to fight fist to fist with someone, but it's a very interesting technique, and I would like to see how far we can stress this technique when it comes to what someone else wants. Could it affect the idea of it transforming into the diamond itself? Could it transform into people, or is it restricted to the size of the actual creature that he produces? Or could it do a little bit more of anything, but its main restriction is that someone else has to want it besides the user? And how is this going to go if he is separated from a group of people and someone else or his enemy may want something? Would that force the stand to transform into something that the enemy wants? So many questions that can be asked from this one stand itself, but we're just going to have to wait and find out a little bit later as we get more about this character, as well as more about the stand itself. But yes, as the plan goes into action, they begin to invade the villa, as we do get a few images of who this individual is, and as more of these images come to light, we get a bigger and clearer idea of who this person is, and it's confirmed by Jodil himself who this character is. He's very famous, he's an author, he writes books, and many of his books are adapted into anime adaptations online. And that the reasoning why he is separated from the entire public and is more or less on his own is because he is one manga artist. And I don't even have to say more to get the understanding of who this individual is. And if you read enough JoJo's, you know the one most famous mangaka in all of JoJo's is. Yes, the Japanese person is Rohan Kishibe. Yes, we are technically in a universe. Yes, we have had someone that is sort of the representation of Rohan Kishibe via Rei Mamazuku. But we also need to remember, Rohan is his self-insert. 
the self-insert of Hirohiko Araki. So I'm not surprised that he's here. But what is even more surprising is what is his standability going to be? Does he gonna have is he going to have the same standability as we saw in Roha Kishibe in the main universe, the first universe? Or is it going to be completely different? Well, we're just going to have to wait to next chapter or two to find out because Ray was Ray Kishibe is within this universe and this brings up a whole bunch of more questions that I'm just going to ignore because, of course, Araki is probably going to do it because we already know why he's here. Rohan is Araki's favorite character, so it makes sense that he will most likely be in most likely his final work of JoJo. So, you know what? I'm happy. I like Rohan. You probably like Rohan, and if you don't like Rohan, I am sorry. But yeah, that's pretty much the chapter that we have for this week for... And that's pretty much the chapter that we have for this month of the JoJo Lands. What is going to be happening next chapter? Well, I think that there's obviously going to be a confrontation between the characters of Jodio, Dragona, uh, Paco, as well as Usage versus Rohan. And my prediction for Rohan is that he may not necessarily have the exact same stand that he had in the original universe. But if he did, I wouldn't be surprised because this isn't the first time that we've had people within the universe that are very much stand-ins or if not exact copies of other characters within the old universe and this new universe and how they could potentially have very similar, if not the same, stands. For example, we had the world technically appear within this universe via uh, Diego Brando having the world in an alternate universe, e even though he is the alternate universe of Dio, but they had a shared stand. But then again, we've also had characters in this universe who are representations of characters in the old universe, such as Josuke, who has a completely different ability than what he had in the original world because they are two completely different characters. But then you also had Yoshikage Kira, who had a stand ability very similar to the one that he had in the original universe, but yet slightly different. So I do think that even though this is technically Rohan Kishibe and looks exactly like Rohan Kishibe from the original universe, he may have a similar stand ability, but it may be altered in a way to be a little bit more combative. And even if it is not combative, it may be extremely more powerful in this universe than it was in the previous one. Or maybe Rohan. Or maybe Rohan himself is just a lot more powerful in this universe. We just don't know. But overall, this was a very enjoyable chapter. The reveal that Rohan is a Japanese person is most likely something that people didn't expect, as well as just the idea and the fact of learning that Joe Dio is a psychopath and learning a little bit more about Usage as a character and the role that he's going to potentially be playing in this story were all fantastic points about this chapter, and I can't wait to see what's going to be going on in the next chapter that we get next month. But yeah. But yeah. But yeah, that's all I have to say about JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, The JoJo Lands. What did you think of the chapter? Did you like it? Did you dislike it? I would love to hear more of your thoughts down below. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you want to see more JoJo content like this. And don't forget to hit that notification bell to be notified whenever I upload more content like this. Do all that cool jazz, and hopefully I'll be able to catch you in my next video. Goodbye! Yeah. Hmm.